Okay. It's two o'clock. Andy said you're good to go. All right. Andy says we're good to go. So I will go ahead and hit record. Make sure everyone's ready. You might get a message that says we're recording and give me permission to record you guys. I think we're all set. Very good. Good afternoon, everybody. For those of you that are joining us live and for those of you that may not be joining us live, hopefully you'll get a chance to watch this video in just a little bit. Um, wanted to welcome everybody um, and say thanks for hopping on and being part of this. Um, at the request of our high school administrative staff, um, there was uh, a need for us to jump on and do a quick, brief town hall meeting, if you will, to discuss some of the um, uniform concerns and issues that um, are facing all of our staffs as we return students to in-person instruction. And so today, joining us, we have Miss Virginia Arrington, Mr. Matt Mullins, Miss Sandy Reynolds, and of course, Andy in the background is our tech support. Thank you, Andy, for getting everything up and running for us. And Dr. Matt Lutz is hopping on his computer right now to join us as well. And so to just tell you a little bit about this format and how this is gonna work, um, staff at both CCHS and JPNAP Early College submitted questions onto a Google spreadsheet for their administrative staff. Those spreadsheets were shared with us at the district level so that we can compile um, those uh, themes that were kind of consistent between both schools um, that needed answering at the district level. And from that, um, Ms. Arrington and Mr. Mullins and myself have worked to kind of put some responses together so that we could share out with you. So what we're gonna do today is take those questions that pertain to district level um, scenarios and answer them for you. There were lots of questions also submitted that were very school specific. So those questions uh, will be answered directly by your school administrative staff. And I think some of them have already been answered by your admin teams and they've done a great job doing that. So hopefully today we're just gonna touch on some of those things that I think are universal in nature. And if at the end of this presentation, for whatever reason, you are not able to, <laughs> you are not able to jump on um, or you still have questions lingering after that fact, then there's a, a, a link for you to be able to submit any further questions and um, we'll be happy to answer those, compile an FAQ document and then push it out to you guys as well. So um, I'm gonna step across real quick next door to help Dr. Lutz because he says he can't get in the link. So give me one second and make sure he's on there and then we'll go ahead and get started. So we're gonna take a quick pause and then we'll get rolling. <laughs> now Dr. Lutz is ready to join us. So, you know, it's hard when you're right, working. Everyone. You know, we work one link that's for us to be able to talk and be interactive with each other, but then you guys have another live link that you watch where it's just uh, for you to be able to view. So we apologize for that little bit of back and forth, but we're all straight now. Dr. Lutz, anything you want to say in opening remarks before we get things started? Um, look, I first off, I just want to thank um, our staff, the high school staff for forging forward. Um, I thought that your effort when we had to bring our kids back to test uh, before Christmas was was very uh, was strong and thoughtful. And um, I, I do understand the anxiety. I have anxiety um, as we 
get ready to return our kids to school. I, I will say that I, I'm also very excited for the opportunity to bring our kids back to school. Um, it's been coming up on a year um, since our kids have been in the building and that, you know, that that's not where we want our kids. And um, we've, we've been able to return our elementary through a very thoughtful process. We've been able to return our middle schools the same way. And um, I am excited to work with you and with the teams. I also wanted to thank the leadership team and Allison um, and Denise and her team for the outstanding effort um, in getting us back. It is a yeoman's effort from the word go. From the seventh on forward, it is a sprint. Once the 25th gets here, by the 27th, it gets a whole lot better. It does. Your anxieties will come down and things are going to work and we're going to get a chance to have our kids back in school with some sense of normalcy. The ones that want to be there. And so uh, we're here to answer your questions. We'll do the best we can to answer them. And uh, Renee, thank you for putting this together. And um, Matt, for your efforts with keeping our buildings clean. Virginia, you've done a, a super job in communication. And Sandy, you kept us up and running um, since March 13th. So again, uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Renee. We can answer questions and go from there. Thank you. All right. So here's how we're going to get things started. I'm going to share this presentation uh, with everybody. So you should hopefully be able to see my screen as we get going through. Um, what we're going to do is kind of walk through the four main topic areas that we broke down um, your classrooms, uh, your questions, excuse me, for your admin administrative teams. And so we're going to talk a little bit about communication, operations, staff and student health and safety, and of course, student learning. Um, and so when we get to those topics, we'll have that. I'll pass off to some of the other support personnel who are joining us this afternoon, and they'll be glad to answer those questions along uh, with myself. So to start with communication, um, it feels like we're getting a lot of information thrown at us. And so just wanted to kind of reiterate that on our website, we have the Return to Learn 2021 tab at the top of our website. If you click on that tab right now, it takes you directly to our uh, high school return information. So as you click on that link or that tab, it directly pulls you up to all things high school at this point in time. Under that, you'll also find uh, Return to Learn 2021 is where we house all of our press releases um, and also our COVID-19 dashboard. Again, with everything else that we've done since uh, trying to return to some level of in-person instruction, pre-K through five, what to expect parent videos when we first were bringing our very first group of students back um, to our buildings for instruction. Some of those videos are most certainly applicable even for high school students returning about health and safety screenings and temperature checks and all those things. So again, just kind of redirecting you to take a look at our Return to Learn website. Um, there were some questions and concerns in regarding to our press releases um, and notifications of positive cases. And thus far, we've been reporting on our positive uh, cases that are school affected. And so just I'm going to touch base on this COVID update that you see housed on our website um, currently and going all the way back to since we started bringing students back to school. Um, we will absolutely admit that we stole this idea from Pitt County who put together a COVID dashboard. It's a work in progress. Um, in fact, Pitt County has recently updated their reporting procedures. It is something that we're in discussions about right now, especially as we return high school students to campus uh, next week of updating our reporting terms. And that's something that we hope to be able to share some more information with you coming soon. But again, this dashboard just as serves as a way of saying to our community, these are the number of students that have returned to in-person learning right now, again, pre-K through eight, the total number of pre-K through eight students that we serve in Curry Tech County, the number of pre-K through eight faculty and uh, staff that are currently working with those in-person learning students. And then we report the number of positive cases, what percent of our on-campus population that that affects. So again, based on some of your feedback for the press releases, in addition to um, uh, questions about positive cases and reporting of that information, we are taking some of that feedback under consideration to look at how we can make sure that we are, uh, again, reporting accurate information, um, but also not reporting information that really doesn't impact the work that we're doing in the schools. And so sometimes that can be a little bit tricky. So, but we do appreciate the fact that many of you had some feedback in that area and we will take that under advisement and move forward with that. 
Um, all their communication pieces that we uh, feel strongly about making sure we get out, of course, include calendar changes and understanding of the cohort schedule and daily schedules. Um, when we first brought back middle school, because it's in a hybrid setting with an A cohort and a B cohort, we knew it could get kind of confusing for families. And so we kind of put out an amended calendar like this. We have not modified our instructional calendars that are posted on our website. Um, and so what we were doing was putting out these calendar changes for families, for our middle schools to be able to send out to their students and to their parents. And so we've done something similar here for you guys at the high school level and anticipate that we will publish these quarterly for our high school families. Um, because, you know, when we throw a holiday in the mix, it also then starts asking a lot of questions. Well, are we going back to the day we missed or do we move forward with the day as if we didn't miss it? So what we'll be doing is publishing this um, for the quarter. So after January 29th, when we start the new one, I'll have a new one published that will carry us through the remaining remainder of this quarter. And then we'll publish a fourth quarter one as well for students and parents and for staff as well. So that will be coming out shortly. I do think it just makes it easier if I'm a parent and I've got to look on the date and be like, oh, it's a cohort B day. That way I know what should be happening on that day for my student. Just a reminder in an infographic, this is what we released to parents, helping them to understand what happens on Mondays, what happens on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and of course on Fridays. Um, just one more way to try to communicate with them kind of what to expect. All right, so now on to some of the questions regarding student learning. Uh, first and foremost, our updated virtual learning list. Um, at this point in time, I think both high schools perhaps have shared that list with their staffs. Um, and that list gets updated daily. So I update that virtual learning list and that registration list daily for um, everybody to be able to see. I think we're on the color blue now for January to make it as easy as possible. If I keep doing yellow, it, you lose track of who's new and who's not new. So I think we're on blue right now um, to update those new virtual learning registrations. Keeping in mind that we have allowed um, and parents are allowed to switch to make the transition to virtual at any point during uh, this semester. However, they are not, they do not have the option to just decide to come back in person. Obviously, they had to fill out that registration form. They knew that signing up for virtual learning was a commitment from now through the end of the semester. That's not to say that individual cases may not be reviewed depending on need in certain circumstances, but that's not something that will just happen willy-nilly where you'll have kids who've been virtual all this time show back up in your classes. Asynchronous Fridays, uh, a change from our high school schedules to what you've been doing. Um, when middle schools went back to uh, a hybrid model and were juggling both in-person and virtual students simultaneously, we did make the move to go to an asynchronous Friday schedule, giving teachers uh, the opportunity to use that time to do all the things that don't ever fit in the course of a day. Parent contacts, one-on-one -on -one meetings with students, planning, still some professional development. Obviously, both high schools were tasked with those early release Fridays uh, long before COVID hit, and so it was a great opportunity for professional development. But those asynchronous Fridays are now uh, designed for you to have some additional time in your schedule where you can do some of the intangible things that have to happen as part of your job day in and day out. Chromebooks and chargers was another question that uh, popped up on your spreadsheets. Um, concerns about what happens if kids don't come with their Chromebooks or what happens if a kid doesn't have their charger or their Chromebooks not charged. And really, unfortunately, that's no different during COVID than it was without COVID. It's just different because you have students in your classroom face to face and some that are online. Um, we do not buy extra cords to just have extras laying around. Um, if a student, my son, for example, um, loses their Chromebook charger and we can't find it anywhere, then I pay for a replacement and that replacement then comes with uh, Cadence Chromebook, same for your students. So not to mention the fact that we do have different versions of Chromebooks laying around. Um, your freshman class has a brand new Chromebook that doesn't fit the same chargers as your old Chromebook. So at this point in time, we do not have extra chargers for classrooms moving forward. Mm -hmm. Another question that popped up was about, you know, trying to figure out how do we divide our attention between virtual and in-person students? So, you know, again, brand new experience, a novel concept for us to have kids sitting in our classroom face to face and a group of kids, sometimes a larger group of kids on the computers virtually from home or whatever setting they're working in. 
so th there's no easy answer for this other than to say it's going to take some time for you to get adjusted to how to navigate an in-person setting with also kids on the computer screen um, attending to you and you attending to them. So it, just as you get to know your kids in a regular setting, you'll get to know your kids and their needs. And I know with some practice, you know, we'll be able to figure out how that attention gets divided. And at the end of the day, you know, we give our attention to all students. And so it's just going to take some practice. Give yourself some grace. We'll go back and use that word. This is not going to be easy right out of the gate. But I know without a shadow of doubt, you're, you guys are more than capable of, of working through that and figuring that out. It's just going to be different. Probably the most frequent asked a question when we started virtual learning from the get-go was about attendance. Um, and so here we are again, having to shift gears for attendance. So now we will have students showing up in person, we will have students showing up off-site virtually, and we will have students who don't show at all. <laughs> so as you can read on that screen, students who show up in person, like a normal day pre-COVID when they just showed up to your class, you didn't really have to do anything in power school, right? The default is they are present on site. So if you have cohort A and you're expected to see six kids come into your class on Monday for cohort A, those six kids show up. You don't have to do anything inside of power school for those kids. If you had eight kids in cohort A on Monday who were supposed to show up virtually, that code now gets changed to that present offsite, that one R code. All right, so that will be a change. Um, you will be marking them as present off-site. You'll have some kids face-to-face. -face. You will have to change those kids who show up off-site virtually on your computer to the 1R code. If you have completely virtual students who are expected to show up online, those students get marked with the present off-site, the 1R code. If I have a student who is expected to be in person in my class on Monday for cohort A, but decided to stay home and showed up virtually for my class on Monday for cohort A, they get marked with the present off-site 1R code. They weren't physically present in your classroom. They were present off-site. They get marked with the 1R code. The kid doesn't show up and is missing completely, but was scheduled to be in your room and for your class that day, it gets marked with a 2A absent code, um, period. Fridays with the asynchronous learning, the default there is the 1R present off-site. We will need to change that if the kid does no work, does not do anything that was expected of them that day, that code would get changed. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna link here to the current board policy in some discussion with Ms. Athena Chastain and many of you as teachers, the cumbersome process of going back and trying to change attendance when a kid completes work um, and we base attendance off work completion is just daunting. And so we're gonna have some discussion, um, hopefully tomorrow evening, regarding attendance to make it easier for staff um, because attendance is really about showing up and being present. I'm not talking about engagement, I'm physically just talking about showing up and, and being present. Um, but I think that we have some ways to make it easier uh, for the attendance procedure. So as soon as we get through that board discussion, then I'll be happy to share that out with everybody moving forward. Um, there'll be questions about, you know, if a student doesn't show up and they're absent and then I get a sick note, obviously we would treat it like any other time. We mark them absent, they turn in a doctor's note, it gets changed inside of power school. So um, it's about working with your kids. Kid emails you, you know, Miss Smith, I completely lost internet uh, last night. So can I please have till today to get that work done? Whatever, again, we work with kids. You know what um, we should do it on the, you know, for the best of the kid moving forward. All right, so now we're gonna move on to student and staff health and safety. And so Ms. Arrington will be jumping in uh, for me, helping to answer these questions. We did have some conversation in the question, the Q&As that you submitted regarding cloth face, cloth face coverings. And one, um, are we providing them for kids? What happens if kids don't have them? Um, and what about if I have, you know, two kids in my cohort A third bell class, do I still have to wear a mask? So Ms. Arrington, I'm gonna turn this one over to you to discuss the requirements for cloth face coverings. Okay, so it is required that everyone wear a cloth face covering. Um, it doesn't matter if there's one other person in the room or five other people in the room. 
The only time that you can remove your face covering other than when you're eating or drinking is with when you are with, alone in the classroom. Um, I know there has been some question as well about alternates to cloth face coverings. Um, it must be a cloth face covering. So if you would like the extra benefit of a face shield, you can wear the face shield and a cloth face covering. Um, the state has provided a five pack of white cloth face coverings for all students, and those will be handed out when the students come to class. And um, please make sure that they get those. Uh, extra then were provided and they should be on set, um, excuse me, on hand if a student forgets one or you know, sneezes in it or something like that. <laughs> All right, so one of the other questions came, um, we heard kind of uh, a few times about what's going to happen if a student um, comes to my class and starts showing symptoms, or what's going to happen if we receive word that a student in my class tests positive, how are those cases going to be handled? Okay. So the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services and DPI have outlined um, how to handle these cases and it's very uh, prescriptive and very detailed and it can be found in the reference guide for suspected presumptive or confirmed cases of COVID as you can see there on the screen. Um, so it, at the high school, Nurse Nikki is providing some information about how to send students to the nurse's office and at NAP, Kim is providing some information about how the students should be sent to the nurse so, um, but if they are coughing, um, if they are running a headache, those kinds of things are um, potentially symptoms of COVID. So the nurse should see them and evaluate um, how that should be handled. If a student or a staff member does test positive for COVID, the school is not going to release the names of those folks. If you are affected because you are a close contact to someone that has been uh, confirmed as a positive case of COVID, then you will be notified that you were in close contact with someone that has tested positive and you will be given guidelines on what you should do next. So again, I'm gonna draw everybody's attention. I linked, and again, you're gonna receive a copy of this presentation. I linked the um, reference guide for presumptive positive cases, suspected cases. This document, especially this, these pages, pages eight, nine, and 10, or eight and nine, walk through how you handle these different scenarios. Um, so this is exactly how we handle this guidance. Once we get this information, this is what we refer to. This is how we then process through these uh, events or your school nurses process through these uh, specific scenarios with Ms. Arrington, um, the health department, and all of those parties uh, get involved with these types of things. So again, just to kind of draw your attention back to that reference guide, that's hugely important. But the fact of the matter remains, as Ms. Arrington said, we can't come to you as a teacher and say, John Smith in your third bell has tested positive. That will not happen. It should not happen. Um, so the only thing that you would be told is you've been identified as a close contact to a positive case. And so therefore, this is the next step. And they would walk you through what those steps would be um, moving and, forward. And um, before we move on, Ms. Dowdy, too, we have found um, that there is for, for the most part, there's always something just a little bit different about each case. So we can try to answer questions about like, what if this scenario happens or what if that scenario happens? But if that scenario happens, there's always some kind of little tweak or something in there that makes it different than any other situation. And so um, we have to adapt to that and be a little bit flexible as well. All right, so um, again, going back to that, please refer back to that reference guide for suspected presumptive positive cases. Make sure you're a little bit familiar with that. The question also came up about how um, will we know if we have to quarantine? Um, what all the teachers, if a student tests positive, does that mean automatically that teachers have to quarantine? And uh, for middle school and high school students returning under plan B, it is a requirement that we maintain six foot social distancing. Again, 
we're all realists as well, knowing there will be times where that doesn't happen for whatever reasons. But um, as far as the adults in the building, making sure we're maintaining that six foot social distancing is going to be critical, again, for under 15 minutes. So there really um, are very few and far between instances in which we've had to quarantine middle school staff because of a positive case in the building that hasn't just been related to a group of teachers perhaps eating lunch together in the um, workroom or something like that. So from a student testing positive to having to quarantine adult staff, that's really not been an issue that we've had to face thus far. So we hope that continues. Um, we also had questions regarding mass breaks, Ms. Arrington, um, and can students, I think a student had mentioned that they were told they were going to be taking mass breaks, so a teacher asked, um, are mass breaks something that they're going to be allowed to do or that they should be doing? Um, yes, yeah, so of course, um, students, teachers can allow for mass breaks, and um, you know, teachers are welcome to walk the students outside for a few minutes, let them take off their mask as long as they are staying six feet apart and your break is lasting less than 15 minutes. Um, and then of course, one of the other important questions for staff regarding leave, um, you know, if I come in contact or I've been identified as a close contact to a positive case or um, I develop symptoms and um, I get tested and I come back positive for COVID, what happens with leave? Do I take my own leave? Is there some other type of leave that I receive? So can you speak a little bit to the leave questions? Yes. So um, if a person has been identified as a close contact or test positive for COVID-19, there is emergency leave that has been extended through March 31st. This is 10 days of emergency leave that does not count against an employee's regular sick leave. But this is only offered once. So um, if you have to quarantine more than once, then you get the 10 days one time and then you have to start going into your own leave after that. Um, there are situations where we do have the telework policy that allows for certain positions to continue to work from home if obviously that you are not sick, you know, or so sick that you cannot work. All right, so um, two final questions regarding staff and student health safety that we saw kind of repeated um, multiple times on the Q&A documents was about vaccinations. Obviously, um, we were fortunate enough to be able to have staff participate in at least uh, a round one and some folks getting ready for round two. I think we had two different options for staff to be able to get that first round of vaccinations completed. So the questions are obviously those dates for those six, second vaccinations are about 30 days from the initial date. And so we look on a calendar and we say, well, oh my goodness, school's in session. So how's that gonna work? So can you speak to um, how we're working with um, ARHS to figure out how we can make sure our folks get taken care of for their vaccinations? Sure, so um, I provided a link yesterday for folks that they could um, register for their first dose if they have not had it and still wish to get it, or their second dose vaccine if they've already had the first dose. Um, ARHS is taking those registrations. Um, when you register online, it puts you on a wait list in the order that you registered. Um, and talking with the health department, uh, they really don't know until they till the last minute when they may be getting the dose of the vaccinations and how many they are getting. So you may not be notified until the day before, two days before um, that on such and such a date, that, that's the vaccine clinic you go to for the second dose. Um, they are working really hard to make sure that we get this information out um, to you. Um, when you register to, for the link, they will notify you with the specific information for your second dose clinic. Um, and they really, they're working hard. They're doing the best they can to get that information out. And I know teachers are planners and we want to know and we want to schedule and it does make it difficult. Um, and I understand the frustration, but we are getting you the information as soon as we can. And if you have any questions, then please feel free feel free to contact me. I don't mind answering your questions. 
I think, and finally, um, we did have questions about water. Obviously, um, we, we encourage our students to drink water throughout the day, but we do know we've shut off water fountains at the um, suggestion of the guidance from uh, DHHS coming out in the Strong Schools Toolkit to not allow water fountains to be used for the purpose of students drinking out of them. So can you speak to a little bit about access to water in the schools? Yes, so students will be encouraged to use refillable water bottles. And I believe that there's a couple water fountains that will be left on where students can refill their water bottles throughout the day. And administrators can work with the cafeteria to staff to ensure that there are additional bottles of water for students who don't bring it, uh, who don't bring their own water bottle um, or you know forgot that day or whatever. But we do want students to have access to water throughout the day. All right, Ms. Arrington, I think that takes you off the hot seat and it moves Mr. Mullins onto the hot seat. So we're going to shift over to Mr. Mullins and some operational questions. Um, first, I'm going to speak a little bit about parent pickup and drop off. So many of you kind of cited on your Q&As about exams and how you know crazy it was with drop off and pick up with exams. And as a mom of an elementary student who goes through the pick up, uh, I mean, the drop off line every morning, um, I can tell you and speak from experience that the first two weeks are going to be crazy. Uh, it just is what it is. So procedurally, it's going to take some time to work out the kinks. So I know your administrative staffs have been working hard to put a plan in place. The plan is what it is, and it's going to probably get tweaked and modified and adjusted as we get um, traffic flow going and figure out what this really looks like in a real situation. Exams were one thing. Um, now you're talking about two different cohorts coming through. So we just know that it's going to be uh, quite the experience, and we told elementary families and middle school families to come prepared. I will say that middle school rolled out a lot smoother than what did elementary school, but then, of course, you throw in high school, and we add one more layer of um, I don't want to say difficulty, but another layer of uh, things to worry about, and that's student drivers. So for us, we have to not only deal with parents picking up and dropping off, school buses picking up and dropping off. We also now have to worry about student drivers as well. So we just ask that, again, any chance you get to as a, as a teacher in front of parents to remind them that pick up and drop off processes are going to be impacted now with all these new safety protocols to please give us some patience and uh, grace as we work through all the nuances of all these new added protocols, especially at the high school level. Um, it will take some getting uh, used to, and it's gonna be a modification that many are not quite prepared for, but we'll work through it. So um, after about two to three weeks, it seems to get into a little bit better of a routine, but those first two weeks are gonna be a little crazy. So just everybody have some patience, we'll work through them. Um, share your thoughts and ideas with your administrative teams if you see something or notice something that you think could be a, a help to them working through those um, issues. All right, Mr. Mullins, one of the questions that kept coming up uh, as well um, for high school staffs was about bathrooms, um, about the sanitization of bathrooms. Will they be sanitized in between every kid going in and out? Will there be, um, you know, what do we do if, you know, I send a kid out, there are already too many kids in the bathroom, those types of things. So would you speak a little bit to the part about sanitizing bathrooms and kind of what that process is going to look like? Uh, yes, we had a each... Each uh, custodian has restrooms, bathrooms in their zone of responsibility in the school. And contrary to the write-up and some of the things that I was hearing yesterday, uh, our custodians will not be hanging out outside the restrooms as a bathroom attendant uh, cleaning as the students leave. They will be, uh, they've been directed to uh, do frequent visits to the restroom periodic visits to the restroom to sanitize the touch points with their sanitizing liquid that is a one minute dwell time so they can get in, clean the handles, clean any kind of uh, high frequency touch points in a timely manner, get out and uh, let the students use the restroom and then go back and visit periodically within the hour to keep track of their restrooms and the sanitizing and their restroom responsibility. So again, I think some of the questions spoke to, you know, how do you handle it as a classroom teacher when kids are going out of your room to use the restroom and there may already be too many kids in there? Are there capacities in the bathrooms? And, and that six foot social distancing applies. So it's just one of those teachable moments as a classroom teacher to tell your folks, hey, 
here's one more change during COVID that's impacting us in in-person instruction. Obviously, I'm not going to allow three kids to leave my classroom at the same time to go use the restroom. If you have to go and I sit and I give you permission to go out to use the restroom and you happen to walk in and it's already full or there are folks already in there, I'm asking you to wait outside until one person leaves and then you go in, much like we do in lots of other public settings or in settings where they're still counting people coming in and out of uh, facilities. So um, it's just one of those teachable moments. You guys can't control that and don't put that ownership on you. I mean, can control what you can control and let go of what you can't. When it becomes an issue, make sure you address it through the proper channels with your um, administrative teams, but hopefully we won't find that being a huge issue. Um, after the high school staff went and visited Mayotte Middle School, um, one of the questions that came back up was about sanitizing in between classes. Um, so before I turn it over to Mr. Mullins, I just want to share that snapshot of a picture that you see before you is actually uh, taken directly out of the Strong Schools toolkits, where it talks about establishing a schedule for and performing ongoing routine environmental cleaning of those high touch areas. Um, so Mr. Mullins, I know some of the questions were one about what are the types of chemicals um, that have been given to the schools and what supplies, let me say that, what supplies and cleaning materials have been disseminated to our school buildings to use? And is there a requirement for them to clean in between each and every class? Um, and, and any other things that you can think of that you want to make sure you address that perhaps you touched on with custodians yesterday? Uh, yes, we've uh, been working closely with our cleaning supply company and the cleaning supply company's chemical uh, representative and we have provided three or four different items to each school for sanitizing and disinfecting uh, like i said before in the, in the bathroom discussion the custodians have uh, one of their cleaning products is a one minute dwell time product which means they have to spray it on high touch points come back a minute later wipe it off and that satisfies the disinfecting need of that product there is another product that we provided in the classrooms and bottles that is a 10 minute dwell time. Uh, and basically that's for the less frequently touched items that are, aren't in the main thoroughfares of the school and the restrooms. We've provided uh, green cloths for the teachers and we've provided reddish pink cloths for the custodians to use in the restrooms so they don't intermingle. And uh, We've also, in recent weeks, since the elementary schools have got back in swing and the middle schools have started using their gyms, we've gotten uh, a sanitizing product at the recommendation of Spartan Chemical to have the gym teachers sanitize the equipment that the students use after each class. As far as uh, cleaning in between class periods, like you said, it's not necessary but if they wish to do so, we do provide the chemical to do so. We provide the cloths to do so. Just remember that it has to dwell for 10 minutes on the surface before you wipe it off, before everything is, is totally disinfected. And I'll just reiterate, uh, as we get rolling through with this, and again, individual teachers have different um, thoughts or concerns about that. If there's something that you feel like you need, work through your administrative teams uh, to bring that to uh, Mr. Mullins' attention to see what we can do to provide uh, some things for you, if that's the case. Let's see. Friday sanitizing. Um, speaking back to that photo that we just shared from the Strong Schools Toolkit about a, a schedule for routine environmental cleaning, um, Fridays will be the days that we do a whole school sanitization. So, Mr. Mullins, can you speak a little bit about that process that folks will see starting every Friday? Uh, yes, with the with the addition of the high school and JP Nap coming up next Friday, uh, we have put out a schedule to the schools to try to be as effective and efficient and meet everybody's needs as we can possibly be. Uh, we do have three of the Clorox 360 machines now, which means that I will have three teams going out on a schedule on Friday morning. Uh, they'll hit JP Nap first. They'll tag team the high school with three machines, six individuals, and then they'll split up and go to the middle schools and end the day by doing two elementary schools apiece. Um, these machines uh, are being used around the country, locker rooms of professional sports, colleges, high schools, businesses, 
they are electrostatic sprayers. The substance doesn't linger in the air more than two minutes. It adheres to the surfaces. So uh, that is, there's no concern about breathing the chemical as long as you wait two or three minutes to go back in your classroom. Uh, I know there's been some concern about my employees coming in uh, with the, the uh, chemical respirator mask on. That is due to the fact that they will be using these machines for eight hours on every Friday and uh, eight hours of ingesting or inhaling this, this uh, substance can make you a little bit hoarse and, and irritate your throat. So we're trying to be uh, cognizant and conscious of their safety in using this product all day long. Um, I just, I'd like to make sure that everybody understands what's in the write-up. Make sure that when my team shows up at your door, we're on a tight time schedule. Uh, three machines is helping, but there's a lot of square footage to cover. We're taking care of classrooms, restrooms, nurses' offices, and uh, and uh, anything of that nature. We're not doing large rooms or the hallways or things like that. So when my guys show up to your door, please be as understanding as possible. Leave immediately. Let them knock the, the, the job out and wait about two minutes and go back in. Make sure you take your any food or drink that's in the room with you so uh, it doesn't get disinfected. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And again, just kind of, I know as teachers, you could be in the middle of, you know, on a phone call with a parent or things like that, but we do have a quite a tight schedule to service all 10 schools on those Fridays. So we just ask for your assistance and making sure when they show up again, it will be announced. So if something happens and they get behind schedule from the get go, it will still be announced when they arrive to your campus that they're there so that you have a heads up. Um, you know, give them the space to do what they need to do, and then you can return back to your normal business. And again, just please make sure you take anything, food or drink, off your desk with you so you don't leave that there to get sprayed. Um, the next one's pretty simple. Mr. Mellons, I don't think I need your help on that one. The question came up about face shields or desk shields. Those are not being provided by the district um, moving forward to any in-person instruction. Haven't to this point at any other grade level, and we don't anticipate doing that when high school students return either. Um, transportation, the last one, um, well, you know that under plan B for high school and middle school students, we can only sit one student per seat unless they reside in the same household, which really does put a limit to our capacity on our buses to around 24 students, perhaps a few more if they live in the same household. Um, and that is crazy right now, dealing with all three levels being back to school. Um, so what we're doing right now is if folks did not sign up for transportation prior to Christmas break and now need transportation, we have created a wait list so that as students go virtual who originally signed up for a bus, we can mark them off the list, add a waitlisted student onto the bus. Um, right now, Mr. Walls and Ms. Brick are going to work to uh, communicate with your bus coordinators at both high schools and making sure that they can let uh, them know when a student has been moved off the wait list onto a bus so that can be communicated effectively with uh, those parents. But just understand that um, transportation is limited to 24 students per bus and that absolutely has an impact on being able to fit the number of students we typically serve on a bus uh, coming to and from school. So that's our process for that. We encourage you know you to still communicate um, from the school level to Mr. Walls and Ms. Frick when you have a student or a parent request transportation moving forward. So at this point, um, we have lingering questions. While we attempted to address um, as many of the questions that you guys provided on your sheets to your administrative teams, again, we didn't address some of them that were very sc much school specific to policies or procedures at the school level. Um, we may not have hit something that you still felt like should be addressed from a district level. So if you wouldn't mind, or you still have lingering questions that you feel like need to be answered, um, as I send out this PowerPoint to everyone, there will be a link to an FAQ Google form. Just type your questions in that form. We'll compile an FAQ document and then share it back out with you guys um, once we've had time to process and respond to your questions. So again, that will be attached at the end of this PowerPoint presentation um, and I will send it out to you. 
So at this point in time, that's the end of our town hall. Hopefully we kept it quick to 45 minutes. It's being recorded. So as soon as Google sends me the recording um, and it drops into my drive, then I will also forward that out to everybody so that um, folks who had appointments or meetings or IEP meetings, things like that, would be able to sit back and watch this again moving forward. So again, we appreciate you guys submitting your questions to your administrative teams and making sure that we tried our best to answer those questions. Um, if you still have questions, you know you can always reach out to us. Make sure your administrators um, are also kept in the loop of those questions as well. Um, to reiterate what Dr. Luke said earlier, um, we know there's a lot of angst around this process and we've lived it twice before. Still doesn't make it any easier and still doesn't make us worry any less about how we all will make it work. But we know that you guys are capable of doing that and we appreciate the work that's gone into from day one, virtual learning. Again, we didn't think we could do that and we did. And um, we're not sure we can do hybrid and I'm sure we will. And we just hope that we can continue to keep everybody healthy and safe. And we appreciate all the work that you guys are putting in to make that happen. So Dr. Lutz, anything else before we close? No, um, again, uh, I appreciate you taking the time to hop on here and um, we're gonna be good. Things are going to work out, and uh, we're going to keep plowing forward. Um, and please stay safe and just just follow our guidelines under B. Uh, if we do our part, we feel that we can absolutely keep our kids in school. And so, staff, I'm just asking you to do that part, what we learned early on. And I had uh, mentioned this uh, at the board meeting, and I've mentioned it at the elementary and middle school. We learned through experience that when our staff members follow the protocols as well, we are able to keep our schools open. And so um, I'm asking you to please um, follow the protocols, keep your six feet. You can eat lunch in the same room, but please keep your spacing um, with your with your coworkers and so on and so forth. And, and do it for yourself and, and for your families and for our kids. Um, it is certainly, I look forward to the day when we can all join together in a mass gathering and celebrate. I, I, I do. And um, I look forward to seeing you in the building next week Look forward to seeing kids in classes, and I cannot wait to walk around that high school and, and see it alive again. So thank you for the work that you've done for the past semester and working with your kids and being accommodating as possible. I do appreciate that, and our families do too. And um, again, to the team I'm working with, I appreciate the yeoman's effort you put in to get this off the ground. And um, again, uh, I'll see you next week, if not before then. Thank you. All right. Sounds good. Everybody have a great afternoon. Again, we'll send this out as soon as it downloads to drive. Have a good afternoon.